Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our third Pro to Pro live stream. Welcome to the This Old House Brookline Project. This is a live stream where our professionals have the opportunity to talk to the professionals out there in the audience. So if you are a pro, welcome. If you are not, you are more than welcome to come along and enjoy the ride as well. You are going to see uh, several things over the next half hour. We're going to give you a quick tour of the house that we're working on for the This Old House TV series. We are also going to be talking with two professional electricians, both about this project, but also answering your questions. You have the ability to get those questions to us from all the various platforms, thisoldhouse.com, as well as our social platforms. Put your questions into the comment section, and they will get sent to us. And hopefully, if we get to it, we will get you some answers to those as well. So for 30 minutes, we are going to answer your questions. But first, I want to give you a little bit of a tour of the project house that we are currently working on for the This Old House television series. You are looking at a 1957 mid-century modern home in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is sitting just outside of Boston. The homeowners have asked us to essentially double the square footage and make them a beautiful house, which Silver Brothers Construction is doing for us. This is the big living room area, and you can see that we have got wide open spaces. We have got a lot of glass surrounding this. We were filming here this morning for the TV show, and the project that we worked on was the installation of this beautiful fireplace. This is all metal. It is a European design, very fitting for a modern style house. This one is actually hung off of the wall and it is what they call a suspended fireplace. So you can see that there's nothing underneath here, that quintessential modern look. It could actually be floating in the middle of the room. It could burn wood. The homeowners have chosen to have it burn gas, but in either situation to have a fireplace this close to the wall, well, you got to make sure the house doesn't burn down. So our builders had to do a couple things to make that happen. Behind the plaster right here, you've got a couple bits of material that are fireproof. First, on the outside, we have got a cement board. And then beyond that, instead of wood studs, we have got metal studs. In between those studs, we have got an insulation, rock wool insulation, um, which is great when you've got heat in front of it. And then we have got this chimney to take the uh, hot air and the exhaust out through the roof with an insulated pipe up there. Just one of the things you're going to see when you tune into the show. Underneath, not going to be cardboard, <laughs> we've actually got stone all throughout this house. And so have a look at this. Oh man, that is our floor right there. So the homeowners had asked us for a concrete floor, and that would have meant a lot of restructuring of the floor system underneath. So instead, they have chosen a four foot by four foot porcelain tile meant to look like concrete. That has been laid down on top of a cement board layer, and both of those are on top of radiant heat, which is all throughout this house as the primary heat source. So that's just a little bit of a tour. But the main reason that we are here today is to talk to our professionals. And I said two electricians, Heath and Steve, good to see you guys. Hi, Kevin. So Heath, you're the electrician here on our project. You've been yes. with us for months on this one as before. Steve, you are the new guy hey, to Kevin. us, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, you. Come to us from Long Island, correct? Long Island, Smithtown. Smithtown, we know this guy. I want to hear your story just a little bit first. I've been in this business about 38 years. I'm, oh, I'm that old <laughs> and um, we do just about anything has to do with electric, commercial, industrial. We work with big stuff, we work with small stuff. Yep. Uh, we do a lot of homes, a lot of troubleshooting. And when uh, you say we, who, what are we my, talking about? My guys and I. Yep, and how big is the company? Uh, we have about eight guys, eight guys. that work for us. Uh, most of them good guys. Yeah. Okay, um, but we do. Most of them, you know they're all watching. Hey, hey listen, <laughs> you know, they're too far away, so you don't know that. But anyway, we do um, every aspect. Troubleshooting is my specialty. Yep. I love troubleshooting, um, especially on the old houses with the old metal cable, you know, BX and, and that what. Yeah. And uh, we do all that kind of stuff, good all stuff. Right. And I was looking over this house, it's beautiful. We've yeah. done a great job. Well, we're going to talk about some of that. Yeah. We also know that you are our home serve professional. We're I going am. to hear a little bit about that in a, in a bit. But right now, we want to jump back to you, Heath, and just talk about some of the challenges that an electrician, in particular, <laughs> you face with a house like this. Sure. 
Uh, it's a modern look, so we've got you know a particular look that the homeowners are going for, mm -hmm. but they also love the glass, uh, windows everywhere. The first challenge we threw your way was here in the kitchen. It was. Kitchen cabinets, um, I don't know how well people can see them, but they're going to end up right here. They are right here, all glass, so we have no uppers. And they said, you know, I, I'd really not want to see these outlets if I can. So they wanted the cleanest look possible. Yep. And originally what we had was we had this countertop was going to run right into the window and act as the window sill. <laughs> so literally that countertop coming right to that right counter glass. Exactly. Problem for you because? Problem for us is we still have the receptacles on the countertop by code. Right. And so what is that code? What does that require? Because so, a guy like me is going to say, ah, just put them to the left, put them to the right. You're not allowed to do that. We can't do that. So for us, it's a 12 inch or greater uh, countertop has to have one. Okay. Within two feet of every break, such as a sink or a stove, and then from every four feet from that point forward. And so in this situation, that means multiple outlets have to be on this run of the We're wall. We're looking at at least three or four receptacles across here on top of the ones we can get away with putting on the end. Yeah, so code is local. Uh, that's the Massachusetts code. Steve, in your experience? It's all, always up to the municipality. And what happens is, in other words, what the code, the code, we have a set code book, yep. and that's kind of a guideline, okay? Keith knows it. Yep. And what happens is when you get into the certain areas, the inspector may say, you know, I don't care what's in the code book, this is the way we want it. Right. So, you must love so, that, right? Every, every waking moment. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that's what they do. And, yeah. then, and then, of course, if I may, you have the architects and the designers who would change everything, sure. and that's why he didn't put boxes in before he roughed it right. out, yeah. you know, because they change everything. And, and that's kind of the story, is he knows very well. But the stipulations that Heath listed here, which is sort of the every one foot of counter, yes, the breaks, th that's those are very familiar to you. Very familiar. You would have the same problem if we were doing this project in Long Island. I would. Okay, so let's talk about some of the solutions that we started sure. with. When that counter was coming right up to the windows, what did you present to the homeowners as a possible solution? So one of our solutions was, doing a pop-up counter outlet. All right, so explain this to the folks who are watching. Um, what am I looking at? So this is a receptacle that would sit below the countertop from this point down. So I know this is a little front forward, but that means that you'd really only see that part when it was not in use. Exactly. And how do you put it in use? When you wanted it, you would simply slide it up. And so now you would actually see something that looked like that. The receptacle that. that was usable at right. the countertop level. It works, because you could come up through the counter. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go into the wall, which didn't exist. Correct. And the homeowner said? They don't like that. <laughs> Please try and find another option. So. All right. How often does that happen? Very often. Right? Very Homeowner often. tells you solve my problem, yeah. you give them a solution, and they're like, I don't very, like it. Very often. Oh, man. So it's just a little bit of back and forth, back and forth. A little bit, but there's always a way to make it work. So what is the way that we're making it work? Because this is not going to play. This wasn't going to work. So after looking at the drawings and the details and elevations a little bit closer, yep. and finding out that we had a very thin countertop, which is a little unusual, we only right. had a half an inch top, that actually gave us enough room to be able to fit a box, a conventional box, in the space left between the window and the countertop. So instead of the countertop being here, our countertop actually is actually down, down here. pretty low. And that's why we end up with what is clearly your electrical whips and Correct. the boxes are going to go in there. Yeah. Good solution, Steve. Yeah. What do you think, right? It's a great solution. It's what you got to do. What you got to do what you got to do. Like we were saying before, you know, sometimes it's an impossibility. Yeah. But then if the inspector starts to get on your case, you say, okay, what would you like me to do? Like, you tell me what you want me to do to solve this problem, and I'll solve it. This way you lay it in his lap. There you go. You understand? Like That's that. the way to do it. Well, Long Island. That's right it. <laughs> lay it in his lap. What do you want? That's it. All right. That's, it. That's good. I love it. So that was the first thing we threw at you. That was the first one. Um, the second thing we threw at you is related to the mid-century modern. Mm -hmm. um, and in that situation, it was the homeowners wanted a lot of recess lights. A lot of recess lights. But a very particular look. And before we find out what they wanted, let's talk about what typically would go into when someone says, give me a lot of recess lights. Sure. So typically we would install something like this. <coughs> and this is it's recess a, can. How big? What are we looking this at? This is a four inch recess can. I yep. see, meaning we can put it in contact with insulation. So yep. it'll work with our open roof line that we have. Uh -huh. um, and this would be something conventional that we typically use. And it sits between the joist bays. You, you between the joist or between the strapping, whichever yep. way is easier to mount it for you. And then how do you trim this out? And we'd use a conventional trim. If the homeowner wants something simple with a regular bulb for that type of look. Yep. The other option that's fairly popular now is putting the entire trim in LED in one. And, and there is a little LED diode in there. Exactly. And that connects, yeah. all right? So in this situation, um, pretty typical for you? 
pretty standard. Steve, for you? Pretty much standard. We used to, years ago, you know, before the onset of LEDs, we used to use the six inch cans, yeah. you know, with the, with the all 40 bulbs. Right. And um, used to get a lot of light like that. But now they came out with these four inch LEDs that are unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And they throw out just as much light, if not more, right. than the six inch cans. Yeah. You can get the look of the smaller fixture while yeah. still getting all the light of the six inch. And designers inch. love this. They love, it. love this okay. because they know that the homeowner doesn't want to see a big six inch can. Right. You know, a big six inch ring. So they love these yeah. and they throw up just as much light. So here's the one problem. Our homeowners don't love them. <laughs> our homeowners didn't love this. And what don't our homeowners love about them? So a couple of things. One, they don't want the round. They don't want round. They, they want, want it the square. square okay. Which really does look great in this modern sure, home. Sure, sure, sure. The second thing they didn't want is they didn't want to see a reveal. So when you put a typical trim in. So let's, let's actually do that because it's a fine point, but oh boy, I hope you guys can get this thing out when I'm done. Piece of cake. It will sit. I'll flip this over. All right, so we are going to be sitting like this <clears> down. And what is it that we would see? We just see that little eighth inch of a lip. Yep. But that's something we didn't want to see in this project. Okay. So now as practical as they are for our project, no good. Well, keep it in mind, the, the cost is quite... What, what is what is it all in cost for this and trim? Typically something like this between the housing, the trim that you choose, and the bulb. Give or take 40 to $50, depending on the model and the yeah. options you go with. Yeah. And so what's that on Long Island? 100 <laughs> <laughs> It's funny you should say that. Um, it's, it's up there. But yeah. again, it's, you know, most of... Customers, you know, they, they look at the price on this particular unit and they don't want to spend it. Right. You know? But that's a great fixture. Well, uh, why don't we start with price? So this is what we ended up with, okay? This is. Which we're going to talk about in detail. But just the comparison, if this is 50 to 100, this is... This can run anywhere from 300 to 500 with oh, all the parts. Man, so you're going to have to make a case for this. <laughs> what do I get right. when but I use But it does have thing? a lot of great features. So um, similar idea, right? We've got a box that will go between Correct. the joists. That's rated for it in contact with insulation. <laughs> okay. So put it right up to that. I see the square opening. Inside here, what do we have? Inside, you actually have the LED driver yep. that powers everything. And this is what would go inside and connect to the driver. And so here, we're looking at the little yellow dot is your diode. That's the light source? That's the actual LED, and that's the whole assembly is considered the light engine. And this, this orange mass that's weighing me down is? A heat sink. Heat, just basically. Let's it stay cool. Gotcha. So that will sit inside here. Yes. Okay. So that gets us our square. What do, you, what do they love about this? Why does this solve our problem? The problem it solves is this, uh, this unit actually lets us go flush with the plaster so there's absolutely no trim ring on the outside whatsoever. Nothing. Not even Nothing. a one-eighth inch fill. How do we pull that off? Edge. So after the unit's set in place mm -hmm. and we set the face of this flush with the blue board as close as we can, yep. we then have this trim ring that would slide in okay. and go over the blue board. So this, I mean, this material right here with the little holes mm -hmm. looks very similar to what we would see on the corners. Quantity. Identical to your corner bead. So this is for the plaster. Exactly. Where does this plaster come to? This plaster actually comes up right to this little metal line here. And makes it disappear. So it's like there's no trim whatsoever. And then how do you finish this off? To finish that off, the trim simply inserts flush. And so that's what they end up seeing. And that's all they see. So this is the idea. Let's have a look at it um, in practice. You've done a lot of work for us already, Heath. If we have. look up at the ceiling here in the kitchen, I think this one here to the right is probably the best example. It's clear that we have the square opening mm -hmm. and it is flush. And to my eye, that is the flushest trim package <laughs> I have ever seen. That's right. Same for you guys? Absolutely. It gives you a beautiful end result. It's definitely yeah. labor intensive. Keep in right. mind you, you're paying for this. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, all the work that's involved, you know, but it's it, the finished product, absolutely you Can't gorgeous. beat it. So we're paying absolutely. for it. You told me the extra cost, but when I hear labor, I know we pay for labor as well. How labor intensive is something like this? Go for it. Compared to, you know, a 10-minute install or something like yeah. this, if yeah. that, you're looking at... 30 to 40 minutes to get this guy yeah. to fit right. Right. And then you have to line them all up. Because they're square, there's zero forgiveness. Right. Where around, it doesn't matter how this is turned. Yeah. Right. See, this is so big that it's going basically where you're putting it up. Right. Okay. And so we, we've got to sort of get this thing square. It has to be exactly. <laughs> we want yeah. that to make sure it's square at the front wall. So any that you have in a row have to all line up. Absolutely. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to flip this thing upside down just so we can get a sense. The other adjustment that has to be made, I hope it doesn't fall apart on me. You're good. As this is hanging from the ceiling, you've got to make sure that this trim kit right here Hits the blue board, plaster level, exact. Exactly. 
Yeah. And so how can you control that? So this you have to set by the two little wing nuts on the side. Yep. Raise and lower that and take your measurements and basically use a spacer block. Yeah. Planning on the blue board going in. Make your adjustments before the board goes in. Uh -huh. Once the board's in, then you can set that into place. And how many times did you have to do that in this house? One or two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, right? We, how many recess lights? 30 of this particular kind that required this attention. Yeah. Uh, 50 others. So approximately 80 overall. 80 in total. It's, it's, yeah. it's labor, you know, labor intense. Yeah. What do you do when a homeowner comes to you, Steve, and says, listen, I want perfectly square, I want perfectly flush. I mean, is using, your first... Using this fixture? Well, I mean, you, they don't know about this fixture. They just come to you and say, this is the look I want. Do you push them to say, listen, I can get you that look, but it's a thousand bucks on opening, whatever. They, they, they will, of course, want an estimate. But the thing is, I mean, these are not, these are easy to line up. Mm. You know, these, like I said, just because of the physical size, you know, you put them up, that's kind of where it's going. Right. You know, um, and... You know, like, listen, I tr tried to sell these, at least on Long Island. A lot of people don't want to spend that kind of money. They hear the price, yeah. and then, you know, usually it's they have a stroke. Yeah. You know, that's that's the problem. Right. These are much more flexible as yeah. far as spacing, aligning, yeah. making things line up and symmetrical. This takes some cooperation from your other subs, such as yeah. HVAC, <clears throat> making sure plumbing's right. out of the way, and maybe moving a little framing. That's right. I know we've got a lot of pros listening, but we've got some homeowners as well, and I think it's a good, you know, they need an appreciation that you're trying to solve a problem. Sure. You could put that in, you could put, you don't care, right? You know how to do them all. Whatever they prefer. Part of what you're trying to do is bring them the information, bring them the price, let them know that this one involves other Agreed. subs, all these kind of things, and hopefully navigate them through the system. Yeah. Right. And that's when you know you got a good guy versus a guy maybe, so, yeah. Right, but all the trades do have to be, he's absolutely 100% right. Everyone has to cooperate. Everybody has to cooperate because, you know, when you're on a job site, it's sometimes tough. Yeah, yeah, you it's know. a little frenetic. Yeah. Well, Heath has done a couple for us, and you're going to keep working on this one for us. We um, are. Steve, in your case, um, one of the reasons you're here is because you're part of the HomeServe network. That's correct. And so in terms of navigating through that system, that is a great entry point for homeowners to help okay. them navigate through. Explain to us why. <clears throat> well, HomeServe, as you know, is, um, is a company that sells people policies. Right. So basically they pay X amount of dollars yeah. and then they get their, whatever their policy, you know, and they get, they get. So they'll call a problem in. Now keep in mind, it's a repair company. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically they'll call, you know, the ticket in and then we'll get it on our phone. So that goes to you. It goes Call right goes to, to them, but then home service. Correct. Gets in touch with you. I get, I have an app that it yeah. goes to. Okay. Yeah. So I, I look at the app and I see what the problem is and we call the customer and we deal with it. If there's a situation where things are not covered, okay, HomeServe allows us to deal with the customer directly. Right. And of course, we, we take care of the customers because they're HomeServe. Yep. Um, and that's the way it works. It, it really is a great situation, but my, my love is problem solving. You know, I had a long talk with Heath about this, and he's more, <laughs> he's more, you know. You guys kibitzing over right, here about right, right, right. Talking about We're talking about all this, but oh, problem solving, I love, you yeah. know. He's more the industrial kind of guy, you know, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is great, but I love problem solving, and that's what home is all about. Good. So it's a big organization. There's thousands of you guys There's out there around the country. About 9,000 right. of, of techs. And they're and making a lot of calls. I mean, you guys are responding to... I know, probably do about maybe... 15 calls a day. Whoa. Yeah, it's Whoa. rough. Um, and then you have the emergencies. Yeah. You know, they call you on the emergency. People don't have power. And yeah, yeah, that, yeah. You know? So nationwide, that adds out to a lot of calls. Did about a half, I think HomeServe did about a, almost a half a million now. Ooh. They're up to. Great company. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that if I, you know, but they're a great company. Yeah. Um, so worth it to be a HomeServe customer. <laughs> yeah. So worth it. Okay. Well, you're both uh, just the guys we need professionals to answer some questions. We have promised folks that they can ask questions. We're going to get Do to our it best. if you're up for it. All right. Um, just as a reminder to folks, uh, it's live. You have the ability to submit questions for these two professionals. You can do that on the thisoldhouse.com site as well as our social platforms. Put it in the comments section. The questions will get to us and we'll try to get through as many as we can possibly get through. through. Excuse me. All right, so <clears throat> this one is from Brian Burke on YouTube. Brian, we appreciate you tuning in. His question is, can dimmers go bad? I've had a few stop working that were brand new, only <laughs> four or five, four, <laughs> apparently the chuckles yeah. are yes. Many, yeah. many. Yeah. So 
What happens to a dimmer when it goes bad? It just goes bad. It just I mean, stops working. Yeah. Really? Yeah. What's going on in there? What is it doing? Is it just interrupting the flow? Most of the time, the customer will call you up and it goes, it will see the little see sparking coming out of the, you know, when the contacts are made with the on and off switch on the dimmers. Yeah. You'll see the little sparks and all that, or the lights will start to flicker. Yep. The other thing you run into is sometimes putting in the LED bulbs. Yeah. Yes. To an older dimmer, yeah. now it's not compatible, not compatible, so they're finding they're seeing a little flickering, a little flash ring, wondering what's going on, thinking it may be a yeah. bad dimmer, it may yeah. not be. Yeah. See, the LED dimmers are really great because what they have is when you open them up, they have that little slide switch on the, yeah, on the, on the, the inside to make the dimming adjustment, which Most is Most homeowners don't know about this. No, this they do not. not a slide adjustment that you can see with the trim kit well, on. you got to take Correct. the plate off. And, yeah. and what does that let you do? It allows you to dim it. Change you know, the like, dim level. Right, change the dim, dim level. level. So yeah. it will yeah. it will reset the max, reset the low. You right. get it within a Basically. band. Basically. Exactly. And sometimes the flicker happens when we get low. A lot of times is when the midpoint or yeah. lower, that's midpoint when you start to see the flicker. Yeah, but to see if, like Heath was saying, when they use a standard dimmer and they put the LED bulbs in, then you're going to get all kinds of problems. Yeah. So if we use LED, do you guys always recommend that we go to an LED dimmer? Always do an LED. Nowadays, Absolutely. almost they make a dimmer that's pretty compatible yeah. with everything. Yeah. And that's mostly what we yeah. carry. It's just yeah. easier. Absolutely. All right. So the answer is yes. They can go back. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the half a million calls a year. There you go. <laughs> All right. Next question is from John Spaulding on Facebook. John, thank you for joining us. John writes, I have a generator question. I have a 6600 portable generator. Uh, what's the best way to hook it up to the main panel? I'm gonna, he's got a second question about recessed lights, but let's stick, let's stick with the generator first one. 6600 portable generator means what to the people who are listening? So typically that would be something like a 30 amp, 250 volt plug that you'd put in somewhere. Yeah, right. with, a, with a six position transfer switch, a manual transfer switch. This is a generator outside, it's on wheels. It's a portable around, generator. Portable unit. Pour gasoline or diesel yes. current to it. Spark it up when you need to. Right, and what, what Heath's right, what he's saying is that, that usually it's a 30 amp plug that's on the outside and you have a patch cord between the plug and the generator yep. and then you have a transfer switch inside. So some people do the transfer switch and what we've been doing lately is we've yeah. been, uh, they make an entire uh, mechanical interlock the whole panel. Correct. And what it will let you do yeah. is actually power whatever circuit you want in the right. house. So if you had a 40 circuit panel and don't yeah. want to be able to choose just six, yeah. right. this will let you lock out the main breaker, turn the generator power on and run. Correct. All the lights by all the what? Clicking them left and like right. Turning the breakers on. So turning it's the breakers on. Mechanical breaker. Yeah. Uh, mechanical interlock shuts the main breaker off. Let you turn the generator breaker on. That way, both can't be on at the same time. So it's safe. So yeah. Backfeeding the backfeeding the panel. Essentially backfeeding yeah. the panel, but yeah. legally and safely. Yeah. And that allows you to select what you want to use. So I literally then, after I do that, go into the panel and say, turn on domestic lights downstairs, uh, the thing that runs the heating system, right. two others. I mainly yes. pick those. But, just, but you can pick yeah, you a can, lot more than you think. You can uh, pick the bulk of everything in the panel. Try and stay away from, depending on the size of the air generator. Air conditioning and, and, and you electric You don't want to run ranges, your dryer, right. electric oven. Okay. But you can run the bulk of everything and stay fairly yeah, comfortable with that unit. You'll stall the generator other than that if you start to pop on the air mm. conditioners and all that. Is John doing this himself? Or does he have one of you guys come out and wire it, make sure that that patch cord goes in correctly? John should have one of us come out and do yeah. it. John, John. Where's John live? <laughs> <laughs> John, where do you live? We got a guy for you on Long Island. We right. got a guy for you in Massachusetts. So, he, so he's John's cupboard. <laughs> yeah. All right. No, that's good information. I, I guess I, we've done generator stories so much, I could not have this conversation without just reminding people when they're burning fuel like this and you've got them outside, keep them outside. These things are off, they're giving off CO2, keep it outside, don't ever bring the thing inside and be safe with that. All right, looking at outlets is the next question. I've noticed there are just whips there now. What is the plan for the boxes? Good question. So the boxes, just so everyone knows, are what? So we're talking about the counter outlets in this case. Yep. What's going to happen is there's going to be a piece of stone that's going to match the countertop <coughs> acting as the backsplash, one solid piece. Yep. For us to put a box in ahead of time, and you've run into this, for them to template that accurately almost never happens. It's much easier for us to leave the wire hanging out right take a little bit of the framing out of the way or make sure that everything's accessible behind the drywall right now yep. and then allow the company cutting the stone to actually take an old work box, right. cut Use that into their backsplash yeah. and that way when it comes in, we can just slide those in. That's and, perfect. And, and by old work, that means that unlike the newer ones, which you can nail to the studs and secure properly, this is meant to slide into the opening after the exactly. fact. It has little ears that would open up and pull in behind the stone to hold it into place. That's what you're going to recommend here. That gets you to make absolutely. perfect depth. It makes it absolutely perfect, dead center of the backsplash. So it's perfect. Yeah. Got There's it. No There's no room area. for error. Beautiful. What are you guys doing after this? I got a couple questions up in my house. We're going to the bar. Would you like that? <laughs> Forget about the questions. I'm with this yeah, guy. Right. 
All right, Allison on YouTube writing in. Uh, Allison says, can you explain how the housing is fine-tuned with layout for the recessed lighting? We went through a pretty detailed explanation of that one right here. Is there a different um, fine-tuning that goes on with a simpler process like this? For something like this, no. This one, you literally want to put this face even whatever the backside of the drywall finishes. Backside of the board. drywall. It sets itself if it you does. do that. That's all you need to That's worry about that one. That's why it's simplistic. It, it just works. It yeah. has a half inch yeah. ring around it already for the blue board or drywall, depending on right. what you're using. So it's expected that the blue board drywall right goes right Exactly. Right. And it, I mean, you've told us this before, Heath, is that you've got some play with that, right? You do. A little bit of forgiveness. And actually with this one, worst case, you'd rather be further up on the ceiling. This particular unit does let you adjust down if you need it oh, to. Oh, look at that. Huh? So it's always perfect. Always basically. perfect. Yeah. That's always. my kind of box right there. That's Fine it. tuning. I would take the whole thing. I wouldn't even know about that. <laughs> you learned something today. Oh, I'm learning, <laughs> I learn something every day. Oh, man. Uh, Gary on Facebook has sent the question. And Gary, we thank you for joining us. He says, the install process for the reset lighting looks complicated. Uh, yes, they both bit. rolled their eyes <laughs> a bit. quite a Just bit a on tad. that. Gary wants to know how much longer does it take compared to conventional cans. We touched on it a little bit, but you're putting in one of those, it takes you how long? A couple of minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. depending on layout, you know, let's yeah. say 10 minutes by the time you yeah. line it up exactly where you want it, get it to the proper height. Um, this guy, uh, assuming you don't have to alter any framing or move anything else in your way, it takes a while, probably closer to 30 minutes. Yeah. Big but difference. And that's, big difference. And that's a really fair figure because it's yeah. usually more. So it adds up when you do 30 yep. or 80 of them. When you have things. 80 of them, it does add up. Yep. Yeah, so you pay for what you, yep, right. got it. Okay. Pay for. Brian Lemire on Facebook also joining us. Thank <clears> you. <throat> uh, he just has a comment. He says he has those LEDs and they're great. So he loves <laughs> them out there. Thank you, Brian, for uh, weighing in on the whole thing. Next question is, did the wall framing interfere at all with the outlet layout? And if so, how do you deal with it? How did you deal with it in this situation? There's a lot going on underneath these windows. There's a lot going on underneath these windows. Because that is not, that's a two by four wall. Um, we've got a lot of glass that we added. At, there was back and forth. It's a long story, but that's been reframed a number of times. You specifically, though, Heath, in terms of the electric, what did you run into? So we definitely had areas where we had to stay away from, but at the same time, we had to put outlets in yeah. certain areas, so we had to be very careful. Um, we lost symmetry without doing a lot of framing. Yep. So we did the best we could with getting the legal spacing, they're not symmetrical on either side of the sink, which we love to do, or keeping the spacing perfectly even, but everything met code and we're able to not alter the existing framing, uh, especially in a two by four wall, yeah. and take away from any structural. Does it, just between us boys here, does an does a, uh, inspector cut you slack? If, you're, if you need to be 12 inches and you gotta be 14, if you tell him, <clears throat> I, got a, I got a stud there, I got framing, I got engineers, stuff like that, I need two inches, do you get that? It's the same thing. I was talking to Heath again about this. <laughs> depends and on your it relationship depends with on your inspector. relationship. We have, in, you know, we have three or four inspectors that we're really close with, and um, you can talk to them. You know, like human beings, you say, listen, I have this problem, it's not gonna meet the code, how can you help me, what can we do? Yeah. And, and they'll, they'll cut you some slack. And I'm sure if it's, it's something that's minor and it's, it's reasonable yeah. and they can clearly see that this is something that can't be right. addressed without a major reworking right. of something, right. they're usually reasonable. Right. I mean, however, if there's a way to do it, you know, and they know there's a way to do it, yeah. they don't cut you any slack. In other words, you, yeah, they, they, if they know you're trying to work around them right. for yeah. the wrong reason, Correct. boom. But if they really know that yeah. it's an impossibility, you know, they're, they're good about it. Gotcha. All right, um, a quick shout out to Sean Galinsky, who's on YouTube. Just want to let you folks know he's 14 year old. He loves the trades, so we love hearing that, Sean. Uh, and Michael on YouTube, we're gonna go to one last question. Uh, he wants to know, did we do a complete total rewire in this house? So give us a sense of what you found when you got here. Sure. Once we opened it all up and how far we've come. So when we first arrived, it was still the house hadn't been touched yet. We were just looking at putting the temporary power in and, and disconnecting everything that was existing to make it safe for everyone to work in here. Um, the entire house was completely gutted. Not a wire was left, nothing was left, everything was done brand new. Some of the old stuff man, wasn't the greatest. Yeah. So it's a good thing we opened everything up and were able to remove it and start from scratch. It's a painful thing for a homeowner to hear 
Um, but you get one shot at redoing this place That's because it, it is right. buttoned up right now right. and you never get it back. We, we're opening up houses all the time and we still have active knob and tubing that we come along. Sure. And you realize that probably two or three electricians on two or yeah. three renovations know how to work on it. Yeah. jumped over it, skipped it, left it behind, and there it is, still there. That's that's old stuff, knob and tube. Right? Oh my God, right. yeah. So You're too young. <laughs> I mean, still come across it. Okay. I don't think we're all too young. Anyway. Uh, fellas, we are out of time. So, Steve, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, a pleasure. We appreciate you coming up. I know your daughter drove you up with you today from yes, Long Island. Yes, I'm too tired. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you fine. couldn't get the plane down as small a spot as it was. The guy's a pilot. Um, but we do. We very much appreciate you coming up and sharing your thank information you. with us. Heath, as pleasure. always, we'll, Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll you all the time. Uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, thank you very much for joining us for the pro to pro live stream. Uh, this is the third. There will be a fourth next week on January 23rd. I believe that's a Wednesday. On January 23rd, we are going to be doing Pro to Pro with Jeff Sweener, who you may recall is our builder from an island who helped us with the first project of this season, Jamestown. He's going to be in his workshop um, and he's going to be doing some pretty cool things. He is going to be prefabricating um, his rough openings for windows and doors pre-cuts headers and jacks and cripples and all that, pre-builds them in the shop. He's going to be talking about how some of the dead corners can be avoided when you frame a house, as well as what do you do when you've got a partition wall that comes into an exterior wall. A whole bunch of things like that in partnership with Festool. Lots of good information from him. Uh, you can join us next week, same venue, joinusonline.com, the various social uh, platforms. There's a pro to pro newsletter, which you can sign up for. Go to the thisoldhouse.com to do that. And also follow the pro to pro on Instagram right now. More social feeds to come. Thank you all very much to you guys. Thank you all for tuning in. It's back to work for us. Take care, <laughs> folks. All right. Man, I can see.